Stan Howe has asked me to speak this evening about Elizabeth Rigg, one of uh, Maine's major historians of the 20th century. Before outlining the many accomplishments of her career, I would like to share some personal memories of her. Elizabeth Ring was a highly influential mentor in shaping my own interest in Maine history and historic preservation. Growing up in Portland, I first became fascinated by history when I poured through an illustrated history of Britain at the age of four. When I was seven, I started collecting artifacts ranging from political pins and Civil War musket balls to Edison phonographs. Within a few years, my bedroom was a veritable museum overflowing with various collections. And I must say, I had two very indulgent and understanding parents. <laughs> Elizabeth Ring had heard of my interest from my older sister, who had taken her American history course at Deering High School. As I was finishing the ninth grade in the spring of 1963, Elizabeth was invited to spend a Saturday afternoon at my home, touring my museum and encouraging me to enroll in her class when I entered high school in the fall. Her warmth, her enthusiasm, her knowledge captivated me that afternoon, and she in turn must have recognized a willing convert to her course and her cause of main history. I say this because Elizabeth did not wait for me to arrive in her classroom to start nurturing my interests. Within a few days of her visit, I received an invitation to join the Maine Historical Society, which opened up a universe of information that I'm still exploring 35 years later. And in those days, you literally had to be invited to uh, join the Maine Historical Society, and every application went before what was then called the Standing Committee, now Board of Trustees. But uh, Elizabeth was vice president, and she had the influence, and somehow she got a, an application to a 14-year-old through. Not long after that, Elizabeth took my mother and me to Kittery Point for a tour of Sir William Pepperell's house, then owned by Pepperell descendant Joseph William Pepperell Frost. And that, of course, was a wonderful experience also, because Joe had all the family furnishings, all the silver, all the manuscripts, many, many treasures in this great 18th century mansion. Much of my summer of 1963 was spent in the newfound resources of the Maine Historical Society, working on the first survey of Portland architecture under the guidance of Elizabeth Ring, then the organization's part-time director. Following the loss of Union Station in 1961, Mrs. Kenneth C.M. Sills, widow of the longtime Bowdoin College president, had formed the Sills Committee in 1962 to chart the course of historic preservation in Portland. As a committee member and historian, Elizabeth had agreed to help the fledgling group survey project and quickly enlisted me to assist. Moreover, I accompanied her to meetings in Edith Sills' home on Bond Street and soon found myself recording secretary. <laughs> the committee would become incorporated as Greater Portland Landmarks in 1964. And I have these vivid memories. Uh, the, the Sills home is still standing. It's a great turn of the century colonial revival home designed by John Calvin Stevens. And it had the perfect parlor for Mrs. Sills uh, in that uh, it extended the entire length of one side of the house, the, the uh, southern exposure, where it was, it was really just a great place for her entertaining. The Sills Committee's architectural survey attracted the attention of the Portland College Club which asked Elizabeth Ring to deliver a report about the survey at the January 1964 meeting. As a debating coach, Elizabeth saw this event as an opportunity to develop my skills in public speaking. And thus, my first assignment when I landed in her American history class in the fall of 1963 was to prepare a slide lecture on Portland architecture. Expecting a seasoned historian, college club members received instead a 15-year-old high school sophomore who launched his public speaking career that afternoon in January in Mrs. Sill's spacious living room. With the light touch which so characterized Elizabeth's writing style, she reported about the meeting in the February 1964 issue of the Maine Historical Society newsletter, which she edited as follows. Earl Shuttleworth's slide talk on old Portland and the buildings which should be preserved was so well received that he is now on the local lecture circuit 
and old Portland is indeed in youthful hands. <laughs> some, of, some of Earl's slides are on the dark side, but the illuminating remarks of the speaker make up for the want of the sunshine. We modestly claim some credit for bringing together boy, machine, slides, Mrs. Sills, and the college club. <laughs> As a teacher, Elizabeth Ring sought to bring relevance and life to history. Her gospel was the interrelationship of local history to state and national events. The need to look at American history from the ground up. She would have agreed with Speaker O'Neill that all history, as well as all politics, is local. Her background and her intellect could easily have qualified her for college teaching, but she chose instead to chair the Deering High School History Department for a quarter of a century touching so many young people with her keen wit and infectious enthusiasm. Her students included uh, Annie Prohl, Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Robert McCaffrey, president of the American Medical Association, David Flanagan, CEO of Central Maine Power, and Congressman Tom Allen. And you have another alumni here. You said, Joe, you said you took her course also. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth took an energetic, proactive approach to teaching challenging our minds, bringing original documents and period newspapers into the classroom, and arranging field trips to historic sites and to political rallies of the 1964 New Hampshire presidential primaries where we personally met Nelson Rockefeller and Barry Goldwater. And back to those newspapers for a moment. In the uh, there was a little office uh, up in the uh, library at Deering High School, and I remember sort of discovering old newspapers through the experience that Elizabeth had come to teach during the war, and she had very prophetically saved all of the great headlines of the war and stacked them up there in the, in the Deering High School Library. And so from a vantage point of some 20 years later, I went up and discovered uh, you know, D-Day and the fall of Berlin and all of that through that pile of newspapers that she'd saved. As I graduated from, after I graduated from Deering High School in 1966, Elizabeth Ring and I remained close friends. We worked together in the late 1960s to reform the Maine Historical Society, which resulted in a major bylaws change in 1970. As board members in 1972, she and I co-chaired the fundraising effort to complete Nichols Hall, the Society's manuscript storage facility. And in 1977, she saw her former pupil elected president of the society at the age of 28. She really taught us how to uh, rise rapidly in politics. Uh, turning to the, to the broader picture of Elizabeth's life, the best summary of her career is found in Draper Hunt's introduction to her 1966 book, Maine in the Making of a Nation, which I'm going to draw upon for the balance of her, my remarks. And I've brought my inscribed copies of some of her books. This was the book that she labored on for uh, really from the 1950s until the 1990s. And it really is her masterpiece. It is a great overview of Maine's political and social history from the end of the revolution until the beginning of the Civil War. And uh, uh, this, is, this is a book which was uh, published just a, a year before her death. Elizabeth Roots lie deep in the soil of her beloved Maine. Her father, lumberman Edgar Ring, was born, appropriately enough, in 1849 in a lumber camp on the Penobscot West Branch. He carried on the lumber business in Orono and served as Maine's forestry commissioner from 1901 to 1910. And she used to tell very proudly about his personal friendship with uh, Gifford Pynchon, who was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, a great uh, forestry man, and uh, the fact that, uh, that some of the things that her father did as a pioneer in forestry management were adopted uh, nationally in that progressive period. Elizabeth's mother, Laura Andrews of West Rockport, earned her teaching credential at Castine Normal School in 1880, then moved west to teach at Pueblo, uh, Colorado in secondary schools. And uh, it was the time when Colorado uh, gave women suffrage. I think it was, what, the first state in the nation to do that. Mm -hmm. Wyoming was. Wyoming was. Colorado, Colorado, Colorado did. It was second, maybe. Right. And so Elizabeth, I think, very early had instilled in her, you know, the concept of uh, 
of uh, uh, women's rights and, and feminism. Elizabeth, the youngest child born in 1902, grew up in Orono, receiving a BA in history from the university in 1923. An MA followed three years later, and she was now qualified as one of the pioneer professionals in the field of local history in Maine. Stints teaching history in New Hampshire and Rhode Island high schools in the late 20s came next. Then a 1929 summer session at Oxford University and a fellowship in economics and politics at Bryn Mawr in 1930 and 31. Frontier history fascinated the young historian, especially the linkages between Maine, the South, and the West, thus the genesis of Maine in the making of a nation. She had in mind a Columbia PhD, but never completed the degree. Maine drew her home in the 30s to Orono and the university. Her first book, the Progressive Movement of 1912 and the Third Party Movement of 1924 in Maine appeared in 1933, and she taught one of the first Maine history courses at Orono in the summer of 1938. She also prepared and published a very useful Maine history outline for public school teachers. She moved to Portland in 1938, serving as state research editor of the Historic Records Survey and helped to prepare a number of important publications based on the study and preservation of town records. Uh, actually, she was a great supporter of the New Deal, and even to her last days, uh, she had a, a, a print of Franklin Roosevelt in her apartment <laughs> because she worked during the 30s in, in the WPA projects, among other things. Ultimately, her landmark reference list of manuscripts relating to the history of Maine was published in between 1938 and 41. And Summers, she taught Maine history at Bates. As if Elizabeth Ring wasn't busy enough, she became a mainstay of the Maine Historical Society, the fourth oldest institution in the US. The society today owes much to the activist role of the woman who served as vice president for many years and briefly as acting director, and whose most prestigious award bears her name. She was invited by the Maine Historical Society's distinguished president in those years, Walter Davis, to research the history of Lymington, his ancestral town. He introduced her to the vast treasure trove of documents which she organized and transcribed in Lymington in 1941 and 42. In the late 40s, the Portland Sunday Telegram published her articles on Lymington's changing land, people, and attitudes and in the growing fascination with the town and its residents led her to pursue research trips to the South and the West. This work culminated in her 1992 book, The MacArthur's of Lymington, in which she reconstructs the uh, experience of one family in a small main town and how they branch out into the South and the West during the 19th century, and where you have literally brother against brother, one MacArthur fighting on the Union side and another on the Confederate side. So it's a, it's a classic study of life in a small Maine town in the 19th century. Elizabeth Ring's contribution to Maine education can scarcely be exaggerated. Her tenure from 1944 to 69 as history teacher and department head at Derry High School brought a generation of students into the magnetic field of an extraordinary teacher whose puckish humor, rigorous standards, and love of history for the sheer fun of the subject left an indelible impress. Her book, Maine in the Making of a Nation, is the master work of a talented scholar, a labor of love, a major contribution to the history of the state. She is one of Maine's most distinguished 20th century women. I end by saying, for many years, Elizabeth lived in an attractive apartment on Pine Street with a view of Portland's Western Promenade and, appropriately, a good view of the speaker uh, Thomas B. Reed statue mm -hmm. on the Promenade. Her later years were spent at 75 State Street, an apartment complex for senior women in downtown Portland. Only in the last year of her life, at 94, did her physical infirmities require her move to a Yarmouth nursing home, where she died at 95 in May of 1997. 
at her memorial service held at the First Parish Church in Portland on June 4, 1997, her friend and fellow historian, William D. Barry, ended his tribute with the following story. While researching during the 1950s, Elizabeth was driving through the Dakotas when an ominous car came up behind her. She accelerated time and time again, but the pursuer matched her speed. <laughs> Finally, she pulled over and locked all her doors as a rough-looking man approached. Facing him through the glass, she announced firmly, I am a woman traveling alone. It turned out he was the local sheriff. <laughs> so all ended well. And of course, uh, as, as Stan and others will remember, uh, her driving would attract the local sheriff. <laughs> but relatives made her tell and retell the tale. I like it, said, said Bill Barry, because it is so typically Elizabeth, and because she never really traveled alone. There were always students, friends, family, colleagues, learning from her and looking out for her. No historian, in my experience, ever loved life or people more than Elizabeth Ring. What a life. And I just want to uh, uh, share one more little bit with you. Uh, in addition to the books which I brought along, Maine and the Making of the Nation, MacArthur's, The Progressive Movement, um, she did quite a number of important essays, and uh, she was uh, one of the people privileged to know Fanny Hardy Extra, who of course was um, so important in recording the traditions of the Native Americans uh, in, uh, in her writings. And uh, in 1976, the uh, folklore group at the university published this book on Fanny, Fanny Hardy Extra, and uh, Elizabeth contributed an excellent uh, essay of her recollections of Fanny Hardy Ekstrom in that. Now there's also a, a, a publication that's really very rarely thought of in relation to Elizabeth, and, and one which is very difficult to find now, um, but it brings back a, an especially pleasant memory from a political standpoint. Uh, in 1965, <coughs> the Democratic Party was publishing a yearbook, and they asked Elizabeth if she would write a history of the Democratic Party. And she did, and she wrote a, a really a, a splendid essay, which was more than just a history of the party, but really a sort of an overview of the history of Maine politics from statehood up till the 1960s. And it was published in a very ephemeral booklet, which there are probably only a few copies left. But uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party at that time was a young Portland attorney named George Mitchell. <laughs> and uh, of course, Elizabeth was always turning to her pupils, and especially it seemed to me in those years, uh, for assistance. And she knew that I knew of where all the old photographs were. So together, we went up uh, to uh, the what was then the Bank of Commerce building, right next to the Maine Historical Society, where George had this just little cubby hole of an office. Uh, and uh, we went to discuss with him um, you know, what this manuscript might entail, how long it should be, how many pictures he wanted, and so on. And, but I'll, I'll never forget that experience. That's the first time that I, I met George Mitchell. And of course, uh, I think I picked up the paper today, and he's been made chancellor of, uh, uh, what, of uh, nor, uh, one of the universities, Belfast, University of Belfast. And so in any case, uh, we, we all travel uh, long and interesting journeys. And in her 95 years, uh, Elizabeth did in particular, and left her impress both on Maine history and on Maine people. Thank you.
in the world. No, mustard. It's mustard. And I started to have it with the Romans were the one that brought mustard over to England. And the English people liked the mustard, and, they, and it grew very well here. And they have changed from the pale kind of mustard to the dark mustard that we like the best, too. And the people that, that grow the most mustard in the world are our neighbors, Canada. Mm. And then the next country, of course, are France and Germany and England. Well, in England, after the Romans brought the, brought the mustard to the, that country, the way that they ate it was they took the seeds and they pounded them and they made it into a little ball. And sometimes they would mix it with horseradish. And then they, it would dry and they could take it from place to place very easily. And after, when you got your hard ball, you would mix it with some water or grape juice just, and then it would make a little paste, and then you could eat it that way. Well, <laughs> for a long, long time, they did it that way. And then in the 1700s, a woman in England discovered that she could grind it. And if she ground it, it should make it like a little flour. And then when you added your liquid to it, it made a very nice paste. And so the man that used the mill, he had a flour mill by the name of Mr. Coleman. And Mr. Coleman made a lot of the mustard that way. And he made it so well that he just took it over. And we still see his yellow cans today. He has the, the soft, powdery, flourish type of mustard that we use today. Well, over in again in this country, we use the, the mustard in, in different ways. And <clears throat> we found out that it's very successful, used with different foods. And then I'm going to skip some of this and tell you that right over in Maine, we have a company up in Eastport that always ground mustard. So she did it for the sardine factory, the family did. But now, of course, they're not being used. So she is going ahead and making very fancy mustards. And she has teamed up with a, a country that, with a company that's making wine, and she's making very special mustards. But we're having, so we're having some 